Good afternoon and welcome to our Grow Native webinar, Meaningful Design and Stewardship of Native Landscapes with Sydney Ross and Alex Daniel. My name is Haley Howard and I am the Outreach and Education Coordinator for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. I wanna thank you all for joining us for this webinar today and thank our Grow Native sponsors so far for 2023. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section on your screen only. And at the end, I will read those out to Sydney and Alex. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be shared with all of you tomorrow, along with resources mentioned during the presentation and Q&A session. And now for some background on our speakers. Sydney Ross, pronouns she and her, was raised throughout the greater Kansas City area and has set down roots in Kansas City, Missouri with her two cats. She earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Ceramics from the Kansas City Art Institute in 2013 and maintains a fine arts practice in ceramics and mixed media in the Crossroads Arts District. Sydney has always had a naturalist spirit with her earliest memories hiking, floating Missouri rivers, camping with her family, and gardening with her mom. Her endless curiosity, stewardship for the earth, and background in the arts encourages her to enthusiastically inspire folks to connect with nature. She proudly leads LGBTQ plus inclusive nature programs throughout the Kansas City area and is a self-proclaimed native plant nerd. Sydney is a na native landscape specialist at the Anita B. Gorman Conservation Discovery Center in Kansas City, a certified interpretive guide, and a Missouri Master Naturalist with the Osage Trails chapter. Our other presenter, Alex Daniel, pronouns she and her, grew up on the tall grass prairies of Kansas in a family of gardeners and teachers. She loves sharing her knowledge of native plants with the public in her role as Native Landscape Specialist at the Anita B. Gorman Conservation Discovery Center in Kansas City. In her position, she combines her decade of landscaping experience with her love of nature. Her favorite flower this year is the spider lily, which you might have noticed from some of the promotional materials for this webinar. It sure is pretty. And now I'll turn it over to Sydney and Alex. Thank you so much, Haley, and welcome everybody. Um, this is Alex. This is Sydney. And we're so excited to present to you today um, Meaningful Design and Stewardship of Native Landscapes. Um, I think Haley did a fabulous job introducing us, so I don't know that more needs to be said there. Um, but before we begin, I do just want to give you an overview of the topic. Um, so we'll be discussing different research and planning methods for your garden, as well as looking at Primrose Prairie, a garden I designed here at the Discovery Center. We'll kind of go through and talk about um, how we began and just the whole process of it up to where it's at today. And finally, we will also talk about stewardship and garden maintenance. Um, so Yes, you already know this is us. <laughs> Sometimes okay. folks get us confused. I'm the short one. She's the tall one. We're both loud and excited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But um, on your journey for um, being a good steward of your landscape, it's really important to start at the beginning. And um, this isn't so much a basics webinar, but uh, we will go over some of the important aspects that we think everyone should cover, no matter what your experience level is. So first, it's right plant, right place. And I'll, I'll say when I first started getting into native plants, um, this phrase really frustrated me. Um, and I, I've come to realize why. And it's because it requires experience in knowing where these plants go. And I think the best way to learn that is to go into your natural areas um, or visit other public places to see where uh, these plants are existing. I agree. Yeah. And I think that it's a really, um, really lovely to go and you don't have to necessarily call it meditation, but just go and sit and observe your local natural areas and see what's working on every single level from the forbs to the ground cover layers to what's going on in the canopy and then what kind of um, uh, insects and wildlife 
um, are being attracted to which flowers. Yeah. And if that's something that you want for your, for your own garden. Yeah. So when you're out in these um, natural areas or just outdoor spaces, some things you want to look for are where the light is coming from in the morning. Um, we have a part shade condition that's early morning light. It's not nearly as intense or hot as our afternoon or part sun situations. Um, but like if you go into a prairie, look around, do you see any trees right overhead? If not, it's going to be a full sun prairie species. Um, same thing, but in the woods, look around. If there's lots of tree cover, you're going to need some coverage there. But these are some ways to really help set you up for success just at the get-go. That's right. And we we like to, you'll hear us talking about pushing the boundaries of plants and always, one of my favorite things is to learn um, a different condition that someone's growing something in that maybe like isn't commonly known and that right. we can try and see how the plants move around. But it is good to have that knowledge at the beginning, especially if you're just getting started. Absolutely. <laughs> and it's just a good refresher. I think every season, I go back through and I feel like I'm kind of relearning some things. Like I'm, I'm really looking forward to spring ephemerals and kind of getting a refresher on that. Um, but with those observations, you this is part of the research, right? And it depends on how you want to approach it. Some folks, okay, so I will just say these are both of my methods. I know it doesn't seem like it would be, but I love to sketch and kind of rough things out. And I also love spreadsheets. I don't know, I'm one of the, the lucky few who likes both. Um, and so if you do better gathering information and plugging it into your computer, or if you really want to see the different colors, um, like the blooms or the foliage has throughout the year, you can document that. Or if you just want to sketch things out just to get your thoughts on paper. Um, I think there's several approaches you can take to planning your garden, um, for landscape design, but those observations that you're out in the field are going to really influence the plant decisions you're going to make. So just be sure you're doing your research and kind of planning things out. And then of course, I love to reference this image from uh, Claudia West and Thomas Reiner, uh, planting in a post wild world. They outline um, some really simple design elements, which I like to utilize in my designs, starting with the top, your structural later, layer. This is gonna be like your woody species, trees, shrubs, or any um, kind of prominent forb that has a lot of structural aspects to it. And then following that will be your, your seasonal layer. And these are what's blooming, uh, making sure you have several different types of blooms throughout um, the entire year, not just focusing on one season. We always make it a game to see when our first bloom is here and then <laughs> when our last bloom. It's always rose verbena. It's always rose verbena in December for <laughs> sure. <laughs> and then finally, um, one of the most important aspects, but um, definitely the layer I would say for last in your planning decisions is the ground cover layer. You may be familiar with this as uh, green mulch. Um, it's utilizing these lower growing species um, that only get to be about six inches or so um, in height. So they don't necessarily outcompete the larger plants, but they fill in those gaps mm -hmm. and they're doing a few things there. They're retaining moisture. Um, they're preventing weed species from growing. Um, and then I just think they, they look better and it's creating a community that supports itself, not only above the soil, but in terms of um, the root morphology. Yeah, I really love how this um, photo shows um, how the roots kind of are all different shapes and they need to mingle and and um, hold each other together, just like you said, mm -hmm. and just like on the um, surface layer. And I think that one of the most important things, or one of the big things that um, people who are putting in um, um, uh, native plant gardens are worried about are big, tall, floppy things. And I think that a lot of times the big, tall, floppy stuff is because of this um, lack of biodiversity with uh, the root morphology underneath and the plants yeah, up top. Absolutely. So yeah, it's, it's not just about how they're interacting above soil. It's also beneath. And again, that's just another reason to have a diversity of plantings in your garden. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about those big, big tap roots on the rattlesnake. Oh, I know. Like how... They need those <laughs> nice fibrous roots of our uh, prairie species, like our grasses and things next to it too. So um, when you were in your um, planning phase of your garden, um, which I just want to say um, out the gate that my philosophy with design is you have a plan, but then you can use your creative problem solving to pivot or improvise as needed. So you don't want to be so restrictive on yourself that you can't shift to make better decisions or different decisions. 
Um, but also having a plan will set you up for success. Um, it gives you a clear vision. It shows intentionality. Um, these are all things we need in our um, public gardens that are especially using native plants since they already get kind of a bad uh, PR. So here I did a sketch um, for habitat um, restoration initiative here in Kansas City. I did as a volunteer master naturalist. And um, I just sketched out a quick idea utilizing some of the, these plants. Um, I've got, um, or this area was over here at, um, over in Hyde Park or Gillum Park area in Kansas City, Missouri. They are replacing tons of turf grass with native plants they're growing. Um, so this is just a concept to just get it on paper and show them some ideas. Um, now I will say something I would do in the future with my drawings is um, have them more accurate in terms of what is blooming when. So if you are trying to sketch things out, you know, just be aware like smooth hydrangea and in this case, I think that's like phlox divaricata, those won't bloom necessarily at the same time. Um, so you could do several sketches or just uh, show different seasons, but this sketch is good to show the mature um, size right yeah. about of not that it's exactly to scale, but right. kind of what the mature height of everything will look like, if, even if it's not blooming. All right. And so, yeah, you can see up top on the left, it's a, a rougher sketch. I just kind of threw in the shapes of the shrubs and some of the ground covers. And then um, to the right, I added a path where I thought maybe a walkway would take place. Um, and yeah, so the point is just get your ideas on paper. You don't have to be an artist. You don't have to be a landscape designer. You just need to start putting this cloud of ideas and excitement onto paper so you can better assess and decide what to do in your actual garden. Um, so these are some of the plants I featured in that drawing just to show, yeah, like Alex is saying, scale and how they'll fill in the areas and things like that. Um, and with, with that, you can just take a photo um, with your phone or if you have a digital camera of some kind and then um, I believe you can just lower the um, opacity on your computer just and then print it off. Um, and that way it's kind of like a shadow of the background. Or if you can't do that, print off an image and get some tra tracing paper and just put it on top and then do your sketch. Yeah, you could do the tracing paper. Each layer could be a season. Yeah, that's a great idea. Okay, so I wanted to show an example of a garden design I did for a friend of mine. Um, and she had kind of a part sun area. Um, this is just an example to show you different ways you can um, draw your plan. So I use Adobe Illustrator, but I'm well versed in uh, Adobe. Oops, I believe we have a technical difficulty. So if you could hang tight just one minute, we will try to get everyone reconnected. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Sorry about that, everybody. Sorry. We had a brownout at the Discovery Center. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. And let's see. I couldn't just have nothing go wrong. That would be boring. Oh, that's boring. Okay. Oops. Okay, here we are.
<laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So the reason I brought up design is to show everyone just another way of doing designs. Again, there are so many approaches. Um, it doesn't have to look this refined, um, nor does it need to, um, it could be just whatever it is you need and what you're at. That is the best way to set yourself up for success um, when it comes to planning out your garden. So um, uh, this is what that garden ended up looking like when you planted it. Um, and so this is the very beginning. And as you all know, um, if you are uh, fans of native gardens, you know, there's no such thing as instant gratification. And in gardening in general, there isn't. So it's a long-term goal and investment. Um, we all know the phrase first, first year you sleep, second year you creep, third year you leap. So this was, is a good example of the, of it being initially planted. Yeah. And we used, um, we did our solarization on this piece and, um, part of it was pretty full shade. And that was actually the issue was that they were trying to grow grass under a really full shade and, mm -hmm. and, um, a really dry, um, slope. So mm -hmm. this, this is going to look so much nicer. Yeah. Okay, and then um, so the idea with this is um, if you have an existing garden already, what do you do in that situation? We get questions about that a lot. Um, and this is uh, uh, photos I took of my friend Susan's house, um, absolutely stunning in the springtime. And what we ended up doing here is um, she was using smaller plugs to fill in around this uh, dogwood tree. And we did we did that so I, the roots of the tree would not be disturbed. Um, so if you have an existing garden, it can be good to take photos of it um, during different seasons to kind of see what fills out when and where, and then fill in those gaps. Yeah, I love this garden as an example for, I'm going to argue, we talk about a lot of specific species, mm -hmm. but for um, pussy toes, because yes. it is the perfect, um, it's the perfect little dry uh, ground cover in between rocks. Like it's not, a, it's not a perfect ground cover for every situation, but it absolutely is that situation. Yeah, it fills in really nicely. Um, and actually the image to the right. So she, what Alex is talking about is this the image down here on the yeah. bottom left. And then right next to it, you can see um, uh, Robin's plantain and uh, dwarf crusted, or sorry, crusted iris. Um, those are also the shorter species that are growing in between the cracks. Oh, you yeah. see that? It's um, got flocks. Um, flocks in the middle. Oh, yeah. And a little fox, too. Yeah. It's a really cute garden. Um, so that, I just wanted to show a few examples of um, existing gardens. This uh, garden in particular is probably been worked on for 15, 20 years, I think. Yeah. So it's very mature, but there's still room to add things. Um, because as you all know, as gardeners, every season brings uh, its challenges and uh, surprises. So um, never dull moment, right? Yeah. And this garden um, actually just suffered a huge loss that'll yeah. transform it in the coming years too, which will be fun. Fun to watch, but sad. They lost their big oak tree. Yeah, that was yard. Fun. So they've got a full... Um, full sun now yeah um yeah and I and I uh so here are some of our favorite tools that we use for um for stewarding our yes. native landscapes um we as much as we can try not to use gas tools um try to be the least amount of <laughs> to do, do the least amount of um disturbance as we can um and so one of my favorite tools is the electric hedge trimmer that's the brand that we have mm -hmm. but there's tons of new ones out there. And um, we use that to uh, cut the height down on plants that we're leaving up for winter. I know we've, we kind of talk and we're, we're, gonna, we're transitioning into um, what mean, what stewardship means in the native garden. And there are so many ways that um, you can interpret it and, and so many ways that, that you can practice it. And, yeah. and I, I think that one of, one of the aspects of that is, um, um, is when you're doing your uh, cleanup for the winter, um, you know, we call it leave the leaves. Um, we're gonna talk about some soft landings. We're gonna talk about cutting stems back. And so yeah. that's one of the things that we, one of our hedge trimmers are the, what we use to cut stems back. So, yeah, so I, I we brought the, the tool side up though, yeah. before we talk about um, soft landings, we're gonna talk a little bit about how we've, 
maintained a few of our different plant species. Yeah. Um, so we use that the hedge trimmer um, in that way. And then five point paint scraper is my, my favorite weeding tool. And you can use that to get in between, um, you know, cracks and underneath roots when you need to sever underneath the plant. And then we always have our trusty Felcos mm -hmm. on us too. Yeah. Um, yeah. That if five point paint scraper, I just want to say too, when we were talking about pussy toes or Antonaria neglecta, yeah. um, it's really nice to help get in those cracks between rocks to like pop things out. Yeah. So it's nice. Yeah. And so some of the, um, uh, I would call this um, tips modified, and yeah, tips and tricks <laughs> <laughs> that we use here at the Discovery Center um, because we are a public garden and we do have to watch out for things like floppers and I apologize for my face going <laughs> into the sun but um we um for our willow leaf sunflower for instance um we do the Chelsea chop on it so some of the ones that are that are going to be on the edges or they're going to be um we know that they're going to get too tall and be floppy mm -hmm. we will cut those back using the head trimmer it's so easy and fast to just cut um you know, sometimes we'll cut a border of shorter ones around sometimes we'll cut the whole thing down I think it's good to maybe vary it a little bit that way you're not um doing this to every single plant every single year mm -hmm. um but the uh, effect is that it uh, creates the or it causes the stem to create even more blooms for some species like this um aster and other aster species we've used this technique and so you can see Sydney there <laughs> with one <laughs> that Briscoe. was not cut and then on the right, on the left, um, that's how tall they naturally get in our, um, and in our, our very, very, thank you. <laughs> Is that better? That's better. In our, in our, in our too good for, <laughs> too good soil and, and too much rain in Kansas City here. They, they're a little bit spoiled. But so anyway, on the right hand side, that's um, that we, ones that we've uh, cut in uh, early summer. And um, I think you say sometime bloom. around Father's Day, like mid June. Yeah. Also yeah, depends that, on the how season. much rain we're getting too. Yes, and um, so they'll yeah they'll bloom more more prolific with their blooms, which yep. means more you know food for our pollinators, and then sh it's shorter, um, and a little bit more compact for um if that's something that you need to have in your garden. So yeah, that's just one of the techniques we like to utilize. Yeah here um and I, I think um maybe your slides out of order a little oh bit, I see I, I apologize anyway well I'll well we'll back. roll with it so um we'll we'll get back to some of our other techniques for uh landscape maintenance but we were going to uh, focus on Primrose Prairie which I mentioned earlier kind of as a site study um we want to walk you through the whole process so uh, starting out with this crazy design I made <laughs> so it's a it's a pretty um diverse design so this is one of the the garden beds here at the discovery center um and as one of my objectives in 2020 I guess is when it started um they said I could design it so I went with the high biodiversity so not I don't think you even can see all of the species I've listed but there's about 20 I think now um as a first time landscape, if you're, let's say you're making your design for the first time, fewer species is going to be a world of, uh, just make it a world of a difference and make it so much easier for you. Uh, do not do 20 different species of plants, no matter how much you want to start small, be consistent with having more of one, more of a type of, of species rather than a variety of species, just because it's going to make, um, it's going to set you up for success. It's going to make maintenance easier. Um, you're going to understand your plants better. Um, and then you can always add more plants later. So keep that in mind. I know how exciting it can be to just go to the nursery, especially spring on the way, pre-order some plants um, and just plot things down. But again, have a plan, uh, start with fewer species. Um, but in this case with Primrose Prairie, I um, was ready to do a more diverse planting. Later, you can do some flopping some. yes some editing yeah <laughs> yes um some. so here you can see this is a uh, november of 2020 and it um it this area um is out in our prairie section it is full of 
white crown beard, yellow crown beard, um, some uh, giant uh, ragweed, mm -hmm. some uh, tons of passion vine. Um, and this was the cup plant. Oh, cup plant. I love cup plant. It's got such a great structure and bone stem set. and bone it set. It's all the tall, all the wonderful, tall, tall. Yeah. Wow, wow. Please. So they said, yeah, Sid, go ahead and um, design this area. So we prepped it. Um, and I do want to just make note that we have the privilege uh, and support of the Department of Conservation. So not everyone can um, rent out a bobcat um, to move the topsoil and bring in new compost. But this is such a, a great privilege to be able to, to do this practice in this way. Um, because this is, it was a really great opportunity to set this garden up for success. So the reason we removed the top part of the, uh, the topsoil rather, is it had an extensive seed bank, which would have made competition for our new plantings very challenging. Um, so we just went ahead and since we had the resources, we removed it. Um, Not only a, a extensive seed bank, but also huge clumps of roots from root mass. a lot of these um, really big tall perennial plants yeah so, some more annuals but a lot more. yeah so we scraped that soil we brought in some new compost um and then uh the image on the right we covered it with black plastic and pinned it down and then the rocks that the boulders we ordered we were able to place them on top and the reason we covered it in plastic is was to help uh prevent additional seeds from the neighboring areas fall into that fresh compost. You can see, yeah, you can see behind the plastic, there are two of our brush piles that we created for habitat and to keep the stems on the ground, but right, they were right in the first, first picture, you can see the really seedy seed head. Yeah. <laughs> right up again. All those seeds coming right in. Oh they, boy. And that, they do. They that do. white crown beard is, is a very special. It's, it is. So fast forward to the following spring when we go to plant. We remove the plastic, um, cut it out from the rocks the best we could. Um, the first thing we did was lay our border. So when it comes to garden design, um, make it intentional, have clean borders, dis distinguished edges, show that intention. Um, it's also just going to help you better visualize your space and the parameters of your garden bed you're working on. Um, and then um, I like to, to plant in sections, but I will lay everything out in that section before I start planting. So that's, you can see the example on the left uh, when we started to plant um, and we didn't have all of our plants available all at once. Plus there were over 400 plugs we put into this garden bed. So, um, and it was just Alex and I, so, uh, we wouldn't have been able to probably do all that in a full day, or I guess if we had, we would have been, it was a bit of a blessing that we had to get plants from a few sources. <laughs> it was great. We were able to support several local nurseries. All um, of them, I think. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Everyone's in this. Um, so yeah, I just, I wanted, it's really cool um, to have been able to document this process. Um, but yeah, so you see how it was planted in May and then uh, we did a light hardwood mulch over it. And just a month later, we had some of our first blooms with a uh, butterfly milkweed, uh, Sclepius tuberosa, and some other plants. Um, yeah, so then fast forward to August and October, um, you can see how the landscape is shifting. Um, so I do want to make note of something in this image, though, a couple things. Um, don't be afraid to shift um, your garden as you need to. And what I mean by that is, um, so I don't know if you see on the right, those two hackberry trees featured in both images. Well, even though the species I had noticed in this spot before were prairie species, I did not know how far the leaf, the canopy was going to stretch over this garden. So though I planted mostly prairie and savanna species, um, there is still quite a bit of shade uh, from that hackberry, especially in the summertime, late summer um, when the sun shifts um, and so, again, with our privilege of working at the Discovery Center, we were able to um, trim up uh, some of those branches off of the hackberry to accommodate. Uh, now, that's not probably like a realistic expectation for your garden. So what I would say is if, it, if you realize maybe a plant is leaning, needs more sun, needs more shade, uh, don't be afraid to move them. Feel free to try to dig them up and um, and move them to a better spot. 
Um, but also I think it's it's important to test the boundaries of plants and, and their light conditions and what they, they're rated to tolerate. You might be surprised. Um, and actually this, even though the, uh, these are all prairie and savannah species, they're all doing relatively fine. The only yeah. plant I'm having issues with is actually rose verbena. And I think it's because it's a little too wet yeah. um, as it gets closer to the tall. Yeah. Place. And so we here at the Discovery Center, some of you might be familiar, we try to represent as many of Missouri's ecosystems as we can, but it's not that easy to do because we're up in the top corner and some of the plants that are technically native to Missouri are so wildly different that <laughs> like think about the boot wheel those right. plants are wild down there so but we do have a bald side for it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but so when we're think when you're thinking about what your um, garden goals <clears throat> are what's realistic you want to think about what the what the land was like before so we we were originally a bottom land um forest with a little bit of prairie to it too so we get quite a bit more moisture than some of uh, some other places mm -hmm. um and um and some really nice sunlight and then we've also got all this lovely organic material built up too so yeah but that's that, not really conducive to yeah. some of our super dry prairie plants we do struggle it with in some areas i'm also thinking of butterfly milkweed that mm -hmm. has trouble too yeah, something so to think about. It is something to think about. So. Oh, oh, sorry. What I meant to mention in that is that we fail all the time. <laughs> so don't be afraid don't be to afraid do to do it, man. I learned so much from my failures and mistakes, yeah. and that's just part of it. So take it with stride. Um, share your experiences with others so that they know and they can learn from your experiences. Um, and you'd be surprised what people are willing to, uh, what insight they're willing to share with Name you. Plant people are so nice. They're and so nice, helpful. So we're you're all, y'all are the best people. <laughs> really are. So okay, we were looking at uh, August October. I can't believe I can't find a great photo of <laughs> from Rose Prairie in winter time. So I apologize, but <laughs> jump into spring of uh, last year, April. I will get one this winter. Yeah. Um, once we get some real snow, but. Um, so you can see everything's starting to come up. That's always exciting, right? When you go into your garden after winter and you're like, are they going to come back? Are they, are they really, <laughs> even though, you know, they're perennials and most likely they will come back mm -hmm. Their you know, conditions are right. And sure enough, it did. And the rose verbena looks fabulous in this, um, these images. So I'll be curious to see what they look like come, um, this spring. So maybe they'll be okay, but I have a feeling <laughs> I'm going to have to edit out that choice. Um, but oh, no. I want to share with you all um, some of these photos here um, because this is these are pictures by our friend Pat Whalen, who is our um, supervisor and one of the lead naturalists here at the Discovery Center. Um, he took some really fabulous images. And um, so I'll just pause here for a second. Um, yeah, look at that. Primrose Prairie in June. Um, it, I'm very proud of this garden. So it's kind of incredible to see um, where it started, it being just a kind of a, a huge, um, tall patch of, um, you know, subjectively weedier species like crown beard and uh, ragweed and things like that, and then transform it into this uh, planting. So uh, Primrose Prairie, I'll just talk a little bit about the inspiration behind this garden. Um, I am a total moth nerd. I love moths. I think they are the unsung heroes of the pollinator world. Um, they often go um, unrecognized for their pollinating abilities. And um, Missouri Evening Primrose, which is the yellow sprawling flower here, um, is, a, is pollinated by the sphinx moth, one of the sphinx moths. Um, and so what did I do? I went ahead and I planted 90 of them in this garden, which um, that was something I, you know, just with my, my continuing experience working at the Discovery Center, that's a lot of primrose that, which is a pretty aggressive species. So I have been kind of editing it back a little bit, cutting, uh, cutting it away from some of those species that can't handle the pressure nearly as much. Um, so don't be afraid to edit your gardens. Um, every season is going to be a little different. Um, and just, um, yeah, I think the, the one other thing I just want to know is how I kind of talked about it earlier, but gardens change every season and embrace that change. Um, gardens are not static. You're not going to plant a garden once and that's it. Um, my, this garden may not look like this this year. 
Um, so just be prepared and get, that's something to be excited about. I, it is, I always get excited because fame flower tricks me every year, it pops up in some other little weird spot. I'm like, Oh, you like that? Okay. Um, <laughs> then I learn. Yeah. But yeah, just remember your gardens aren't static. They're just like you and me. They're dynamic, right? Okay. Oh, and, and speaking, uh, speaking of, of owning up, owning <laughs> up on things that did not work. Let me just say, here's a plant. I will, I think I'll be editing Somebody out. Somebody recommended spray. this plant for primrose prayer. I recommend Rigid goldenrod, Solidago rigida. Um, this is an example of um, a test we, we tried to do in this garden that didn't go well. <laughs> so we tried the Chelsea chop on this plant, um, but some things I didn't think about were, uh, we were in a drought. Why didn't I water that after I had like stressed this plant out? Or did you water it too much? No, because... I didn't water it at all. But then you oh. can see it still developed powdery mildew anyway. Um, so I have heard that, sorry, the sun is chasing us. So, okay. so um, that was something we learned about this plant is it, it's, um, in the first and second year, I've heard it gets real, it's really tall and lanky, which is not unusual for a lot of our native plants in their first couple uh, seasons, growing seasons. But this plant was so tall. So I decided to try the Chelsea chop on it because it is in the aster family. Um, and you can see it did sprout back. Um, so again, mimicking that herbivory, that, that um, pressure it would have experienced naturally from um, wildlife. But I could have cut either probably cut it sooner and or given it some water after I did that. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I just wanted to share that with you all. Yeah. So, and I'm going to try it again. I'm going to try the Chelsea chop again this year on this plant, but uh, just knowing how things went um, last year, yeah. maybe I'll have a slightly different approach. Yeah. And the drought, you know, drought always want to keep that in mind too, especially when, I mean, you all already know this, I'm sure, but especially when you're planting new gardens, you want to make sure to keep those watered for the first year um, especially in the last couple of years we've definitely had to we don't normally water um, in a normal rain year but the last couple of years we've had to turn on the sprinklers for yeah. some of our more established beds so yeah no shame in watering during our drought you know and I guess something we haven't talked about really is like gardening goals mm -hmm. um, that in your whole process with your gardens no matter if you're creating a new one or working on an already established one being clear about what your goals are as a gardener, whether you are wanting to support wildlife, whether you want a certain aesthetic in your garden um, or certain maintenance practices, that's all, all these um, goals are going to inform the types of plants you want to add to your garden. So speaking of stewardship and maintenance practices, how many of you left your leaves this year? <laughs> These are examples of our artful brush piles. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So we um we have come up with several different ways. So ideally we would um burn our prairie plantings. Um naturally prairie plantings and prairie uh, plants are um adapted to burn occasionally, but unfortunately because we're in a city we're not able to do that. So we have to get creative. And so we've got all these lovely big long stems, a lot of stems that are harboring um, baby insects and um, food for birds and also shelter for mm -hmm. other animals. Um, so we have uh, in the uh, past, for the past few years, we've built artful brush piles. Yes, I love <laughs> it. So, I do too. It's, but you know, it's, it's a really fun. great way if you are not able to um, leave your plant material up to support wildlife, this is a great option. So yeah. the practice we recommend is cutting the stems to be about uh, 10 to 12 inches tall. Right. Um, and then you can take this plant material and get the family involved tie it up, um, yes. make it, make it a sculpture or put it up against a tree. Right. Bund you can do bundles to make, um, building material. Um, you can build small shelters when we've built our brush piles and then a snow has come. We always go and look cause there's tracks definitely for rabbits. Like on the left, um, we, <laughs> we love those little buns around here. <laughs> so we, um, for the most we, part, for the most part, <laughs> except when they rip our seeds out, but 
Um, so we uh, provide shelter for animals in those brush piles. Um, the birds love them. You'll always see them hanging out in there um, and pecking seeds off or just taking shelter. Um, and then this other animal that we have at the Discovery Center loves them too, called children. Children, children. love those brush piles. <laughs> they they're, do. they're fun to build and fun to play. They really are. So that's an option if you if you do have to cut down your plant material. Yeah. And one of the do you want to talk about galls? <laughs> Golly, G. I Willikert. Like like I love galls. So um, if you've been to the Discovery Center recently, you'll see our temporary exhibit of of Winter Woods, which features lots of different galls. But this illustration by Emily Damstra is, uh, I think, a really great representation of these strange and unusual galls you can see in. Um, uh, standing plant material this time of year. They they especially stand out, I think, this time of year, but you'll yeah. see them during the summer and fall. And, you know, what is a gall? A gall is insect architecture. Right. Um, so what we're seeing is um, flies and moths and wasps, uh, certain species of them anyway, will inject their egg into the plant stem or leaf bud and there's a hormone that's released by the insect, which um, mixes with the plant. The plant has a response and creates these seemingly unsightly uh, structures. But guess what? Um, our plants and wildlife have evolved for thousands of years. So typically, galls do not damage the plant. They're kind of used to it um, in some ways. Yeah. And this is, I, I did want to mention before, you know, we play around with goldenrods. I feel like the native plant nurseries are always coming out with a new goldenrod every year that, that we can <laughs> have. There's so many native goldenrods and we yeah. struggle with some of the species like Canada goldenrod, but sure. we favor and cherish some of the other species like the showy goldenrod mm -hmm. and the rigid goldenrod. Now this one would be in a Canada goldenrod. So we, we uh, when we're doing our stewardship, we try not to let Canada goldenrod completely take over a bed, but we do have areas at the Discovery Center, and I know we're lucky enough to have this where we can let Canada goldenrod kind of take over, and it provides such such a huge amount of uh, food source of pollen and nectar for pollinators. And then also, as you can see, these beautiful galls and shelter mm -hmm. in the winter time. So and, and throughout the year, the galls are throughout. So you might be thinking, well, okay, Sid now, why, why galls though? Like, what's the point? Well, these little um, strange shapes are actually prepackaged meals for our overwintering birds. Um, so if you like to see black capped chickadees, if you like woody, um, downy woodpeckers, then these uh, galls are going to be supporting those those birds and more um, because they're high in protein and fat and the birds know that they're in there. So uh, you can see that middle image, um, a, a bird had already pecked on this one. Um, but yeah, this is the goldenrod gall moth and um, it has a very unique shape. So it's just yeah. showing like leaving your plant material up as a way of supporting wildlife in your yeah. backyard. And then knowing what wildlife you have available to you and understanding the host plants and the home plants mm -hmm. relationship between those insects and those plants. And you can get a lot of that with a high amount of biodiversity, but also if you're looking to support something specific like you are with Primrose Prairie yeah. and moths, then you can focus <laughs> then on plant moths. 90 primroses yeah. like I was telling them about. <laughs> don't plant 90 primroses. You don't need that many no, that's probably. A lot. It's, a lot. <laughs> it's pretty, but it's a lot. And speaking of that, um, we I wanted to just talk about soft landing a little bit because I really love this term. And and this is from these photos are from Heather Holmes' uh, website. Thank you, Heather. And, yeah, should I should I just read it out real quick? Yeah, so soft landings are diverse native plantings under keystone trees or any other regionally appropriate native tree. These plantings provide critical shelter and habitat for one or more life cycle stages of moths, butterflies, and beneficial insects, such as bumblebees, fireflies, lacewings, and beetles. In addition to plants, soft landings also include leaf litter, duff, and plant debris. So that's everything we're talking about. So what's important, not just the over, the food for the overwintering birds and uh, wildlife, but the next, literally the next generation of insects is in that plant material, the fallen leaves, the, oh, do we have the next yes slide. so the fallen leaves if you look at that picture right in the middle there um i don't see if any of you can spot it but right there that is in one of our soft landing okay. areas in our pino cove in um one of our beds that has well it's just right outside one of our beds i'll say that that has um a lot of ground cover species love spring ephemeral species 
and a lot of uh, leaf litter that's fallen. And what's it, the leaf? Okay, so it's a cocoon of the polyphemus moth, that's which right. you can see on the left. I found that last year um, hanging out on a shrubby St. John's wort waiting for a mate to come around. Um, it's got the big um, antenna, so you can tell it's a male. Yeah. Um, but that it's so exciting. So this is what is in the soft landing. Right. So the cocoon on the yeah. top right in my hand there, that is the cocoon from the picture um, on the left there. So you can't always see what you're what you're protecting, what you're saving, but mm -hmm. it's it's there if you just go digging. Yeah. So I'm going to I'm going to step back to this uh, previous slide real quick and talk. I want to mention with soft landings, mm -hmm. the purpose, you know, is um, with around these trees, make sure you're planting um, appropriate plants that can handle leaves being fallen on them and, and staying there, right? Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't want to plant like prairie species that uh, they probably wouldn't thrive anyway under the tree because they don't have enough sun. Um, but again, going back to the thinking about your natural areas um, is going to also inform how you maintain them. So prairie plants don't like to be smothered in leaves. Mm -hmm. So if your plants, you know, because in, in Kansas City, especially we have smaller uh, lot sizes typically, and um, you might have a section, a prairie section, but maybe the leaves from the tree in your front yard blow and cover it up. So you'd want to maybe move those leaves to a more appropriate spot, like mm -hmm. a soft, like where they're, you know, maybe where they're supposed to be like under the tree or yeah. somewhere else in your yard where yeah. they can stay. For sure. And if y'all have read, I, I know you have, I know you've read um, The Nature of Oaks um, and um, mm -hmm. It's on my nightstand. But I haven't I, started it yet. I'm so yes. excited. By uh, Doug Tallamy, and he talks about the keystone species of trees. And in Kansas City, um, I believe oaks, willow, like oaks are the number one. And then willows, maples, black cherries, um, every, all of our native trees have a huge list of uh, uh, pollinators that they support. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're so, and, and a lot of you will be lucky enough to have one of those in your yard already. Yeah. Um. And sorry, at the bottom you have right to there. Tell us I know. About sorry. That, I said, that was the first time I ever found a um over. I guess it was over there. It was overwintering. Um. Or taking shelter there, but and that was in a smooth high drainage. I know. I felt awful. I I never cut another stem after that. <laughs> it was end. a smooth high drainage of stem, and I and I cut it and. Uh, that was probably, we do use some of our um, plants for some of our winter programs and for some, um, some yeah, some wreath making. Sorry, stuff. I'm just razzing you, but it's, I know, it's but really cool to see though. Yeah. Like, what? What so what it's an overwintering bee. Um, and so they live in these pithy or hollow stems, like the smooth hydrangea, purple mm -hmm. cone flower and things like that. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a wonderful, just a wonderful oh. note to end on. Yeah. And Look at us. We still have time for questions. Oh, we, did. <laughs> we did it. Even with all the. <laughs> yes. So, so I know we, we went through a lot of information, but as we're kind of um, before we go into questions, we do just want to plug in some of our upcoming programs here at the Discovery Center and virtually. Um, as you may know, all of our programs through Missouri Department of Conservation are free and open to the public. Registration um, in advance is required, but we have our uh, monthly native landscape chat. Join Alex and I in person every first Friday. Uh, we have a couple of special events coming up like Urban Woods, where you can learn all things woods in winter, including how to tap uh, trees for syrup, make how to make rope out of native plants, like Rattlesnake Master, um, learn how to make ink with me. I'm obsessed with making ink with native plants. Um, and then, of course, we have our ongoing. Oh, virtual... wait, sorry, I have to mention really quick. We tap sycamore trees Ooh. for the first time here, and I am dying. I'm excited. Sycamore that's going to be wild. Um, so that'll be there. And then, of course, native plants at new deep roots. And then, if you want to learn more about the specifics of uh, landscape design, join us virtually on Saturday, February 25th. We will, I will go into the nitty gritty about philosophies, aesthetics. Um, I'll sit down, pen to paper, show you how to design your own native plant garden. Are you going to teach me how to draw? Well, I'm going to teach you how to draw. Yay! Um, no, that takes, that's just another tool in your oh. toolbox that takes practice. <laughs> um, all right. So with that, um, I'm going to um, turn it over to Haley and we'll go from there. Uh, what a great presentation. Appreciate it. And we do have a lot of questions that have um, been raised throughout the presentation. So we're just gonna uh, get right to those. And so 
get your thinking caps on. We're yeah. ready. We're, we're all right. <laughs> so, uh, and if we don't answer all these questions today, just um, be aware that we will send um, Sydney and Alex the list of questions that we don't get to. And I hope that they would answer those and send those back so we can follow up. And I'm sure that you guys would be okay with that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So, um, at the beginning of your slideshow, you had a spreadsheet of heights and widths, and uh, someone was at Gerald was asking what the color grid displayed at the bottom of the sheet um, represented. Yes, thank you. I'm glad um, that you asked about that. And um, so that spreadsheet was inspired by um, our friend Anya. And I'm sorry, Anya, I don't know how to say your last name, but it's Pitch. <laughs> Starts with a W. Um, she inspired me with one of her presentations, um, and it's just capturing what a plant looks like, like specifically the color of the plant um, at a certain time of um, year. So even I'm, I'm showing not only the bloom color, but also what the foliage color shifts to in winter and fall. Um, and it also showed, um, you know, um, what it looks like when it's dormant, if they're, or, you know, not fully dormant, but has any slight colors to it. Great. Thank you. And we will be sharing this uh, presentation with all the participants. So uh, please feel free to go back through the presentation and look at different slides um, for refreshers. Mm -hmm. All right. The next question comes from uh, Mary. Uh, she asks, how do you recommend starting native plants in a traditional lawn? Kill your lawn. No, yeah. <laughs> kill it first. Um, you will have to prep your space, right? So you saw when we were talking about Primrose Prairie, um, we we did remove the existing vegetation, and that would be the same for a lawn. So there's a few different ways to go about that. Yeah. So if you've got a full sun situation, we always recommend if you can doing solarization, which is using clear plastic for to basically cook the vegetation out, and that works for some species. Um, something that we learned last year is that it does not work for bindweed. Sure doesn't. It also doesn't work for poison ivy. So you want to know what species you have that you're trying to kill. For lawn grasses, they're insanely easy to kill. They don't want to be here anyway. They, yeah, they yeah. don't like it. So they, so covering those, if it's mostly just grass, covering that with clear plastic for six, we try to do six weeks in the it, when it's warmer outside. When so really we will hot, wait until, warm. yeah, heat is best. But we will wait until our uh, midsummer to late summer to do a prep for a fall planting. Yeah. So at this time of year, we're telling we're getting people excited about their designs and what plants they are thinking about. And then if they do want have to prep, you want to get started with that in about June. And well, then it depends too, unless yeah. you do the uh lasagna cardboard method, which actually I prefer. I know that's you can Everyone do, has their own opinions yeah. on that. You can do lasagna and cardboard, which is the cardboard. You lay the cardboard over and then mulch and then you plant into that. But it, it completely depends on what species you're trying to kill. For grass, for just grass, that will definitely work. So easy. Um, and I, I actually, I want to back up just a little bit. You would, I'd recommend you cut that grass, regardless of solarization or not. I would cut it short. Mm -hmm water it yeah. and then cut either you're covering it with plastic or you're covering it with cardboard and then I actually do compost I don't do mulch on top um and I plant right into it but you could use mm -hmm. unless you're talking about mulching with compost but um yeah on, so on our um for some of our and it always depends different yeah different mulch for different people but we try to use only hardwood untreated mulch for most of our beds um in primrose prairie used a lot of rock which is appropriate mm -hmm. for the site and then for um, our woodland plantings, we try to use um, mm -hmm. either cheap, yeah, chopped up leaves or um, uh, natural hard. Yeah, but we'll go into more detail about prepping your garden for landscape design at our uh, program on Saturday, February 25th. Yeah. I just have to mention you, you take the plastic off at the end of the six months. Oh yeah. <laughs> and then you can don't do plant the lasagna. Plastic. Yeah. No, don't do that. But you can, you well, can yeah. do the lasagna. You can plant it into the cardboard. That's all. Thank you. All right, next question is uh, from Karen. She's asking after taking a picture of an area, do you blow it up and then use that uh, kind of as tracing? Yeah, that's, that's uh, I sh showed that method earlier, how I took a photo or we had a photo um, and you can either, I think the easiest way, if you don't know how to like lower the opacity, don't worry that. And if you're like, what are you talking about? Just print off the image 
and get some tracing paper from your local art supply store, put it over top and you can just trace the general shapes and then fill in um, with your own drawings of what you hope to see in your landscape. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, the next question is from Debbie. She has a slope covered in, or she needs a slope covered in ground cover to avoid mowing. Mm -hmm. um, the high point is at the end of the yard and the lowest point is next to the neighbor's fence. Uh, do you have any suggestions for good ground cover plants for a slope in mostly a sunny condition? Uh, yeah, wild strawberry. <laughs> oh wild strawberry is can't a, stop, won't stop, won't stop, can't stop. But it covers the ground, and it is it it loves a sunny situation, and it creeps it's short. Really low. Yeah, it's nice and short, very short. Um, it definitely will use. spread. Definitely. Um, I, that's a solid option. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking it, it also well, it also it depends on it depends on what's already growing there too. If it's <laughs> turf grass, it'll be super easy to add it in, but. I always find we get I get this question a lot of I have a slope I don't want to mow what do I plant and it if you have like I'm thinking how a lot of people say like they've got winter creeper or something like already existing vegetation mm -hmm. it's just hard to get rid of that um, mm -hmm. but if it if it's clear and ready to go I would say strawberry would be a great sunny spot if you want to fill it in something to fill in fast yeah and we've we've um, really struggled with strawberry we used it in the wrong way when we first planted it and we learned our lesson and it is one of the we we don't often recommend monocultures but if you're looking for that for a specific reason that's a really good plant for it. yeah it's uh, I will because it will make it it will make a monoculture yeah I will. I will say strawberry is a great plant to add to a mature um, existing garden and not one that you are just starting out with unless you want a monoculture. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Next question is from Lisa. She wanted to know if you could get a, give examples of green mulch species for shade and part sun. Pacra obovada, which mm -hmm. is round leaf ground sole. That's my number one go-to. Um, for like a true shade, shade, um, Pacra aurea, uh, that's the other uh, round leaf ground sole. I don't, I can't remember the common name for, for aurea species, but that one is more shade tolerant, but I find Pacra obovada is great in part mm -hmm. sun and sun. Um, and I think it handles a pretty good amount of shade. Personally, yeah. But. Uh, we also love um, wild ginger is a really, yeah. um, a really important one. If you can get a mix of some of these together, it's really nice to have um what else do we we also use columbine actually we cover? do use call yeah columbine as a ground cover um because even though it's not it grow you know it blooms it's taller once you deadhead it um or if you do deadhead it um and then the basal foliage stays nice and short and it's yeah. really pretty in winter it's really pretty. yeah if you have columbine in your art yard go look at it it's and check out that foliage it looks like a watercolor painting so nice thank you all right, next question is, um, Jackie's wondering if you if you all do any, have any kind of a side project where you develop and help draw up plans for folks. We do not at this time, but thank you for asking. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for asking. All right. yeah. Refer thank to you. your Grow Native Resource Guide for our help in that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, another question from, Vanessa, um, a lot, there have been several questions on mulch, and so I think we've kind of addressed those, so I'm going to just move past some of those. Um, yeah, I'll just say join us for that um, DIY landscape design class, because we will go over the pros and cons of mulch and that more in depth. And the different types and what, when and where to use them. Great. All right, so Bill's asking... Um, if you had any ideas um, to add to a quarter acre flat rectangular plot that is being turned from pasture to prairie, um, he hadn't really considered any special features or planting areas. He was just gonna do a prairie mix. Um, do you have any suggestions on adding more interest? I Well, I guess my feedback in general is what are your gardening goals? Um, mm -hmm. are you trying to create habitat, like, um, cover or shelter for wildlife? Or are you trying to attract pollinators? So, you know, kind of that 
it's such a subjective thing. Um, so I like to just yeah. defer back to, you know, in general, what are your goals? And that's going to inform your decision. Yeah. And the, I know that a lot of nurseries and we never plant by seed um, because there's just, we, we, our gardens are more uh, edited. They're edited <laughs> at a, at a, um, I, and, and plant it. We are lucky enough to have, to be able to plant plugs, um, here at the discovery center mostly. And we don't have to use seed. Um, but in those bigger areas, it makes sense to, to do that. And I've seen that a lot of the nurse data plant nurseries, um, that they have, if the, the mix that you have is probably specific, for um, either the type of site that you have or the or your gardening goals, if it's wildlife cover pollinators. Um, but yeah, whatever prairie mix you get, um, just you know, our our we we don't we don't technically deal in seed uh, um, seeding large plots, but but the what we do always recommend is to try and source your seeds as close to you as possible. So you've got some of that local ecotype, which is going to do better in your area. But yeah, anything you can do for pollinators, pollinators is always great, especially during prairie restoration. That's who we're always thinking about anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Jenny asked if you have any medium, favorite medium height grasses or sedges that would uh, work well in a part shade situation. Ooh, oh, we need to do a medium grass. height. Yeah, I know, medium. medium. I want to do a presentation called Sedge Head Sedge Heads Unite. Um, we need to learn all of our sedges. That's first. the hard part. Well, so one that I just I'll talk about one that I'm um kind of experimenting with right now. Um, again, do your research. You know, maybe this isn't a great fit for you, but um, beak grain. I can't think of the Latin name right now, but it's one that Merv is recommending for shadier areas, and it's a um, grass species. Um. But it, it, it's actually like medium height. So I would say for me, I'm five foot four and it comes up to like just below my knees. Um, so that could be a good one. And um, so for more, did you say more shady situations, Haley? Shade or part sun. Shade or part sun. What about I love oak sedge. I, it's sh way shorter than that, but oak sedge is such a great plant. I just want to say I love having sedges and grasses in your garden because well, not only is it a nice contrast in texture, like having the fine texture with the broad leaves, but it's also a great transition from the appearance of a lawn to a garden. Mm -hmm. So I'm a huge fan of adding those, but oak sedge yeah. is really great. Oak sedge is good. Um, we, we've used white sedge here too, that Carex blanda that um, kind of pops up. That, I would I would call that one more of a medium medium one. I'm gonna um, also Carex abernia um, is one that we have mm -hmm. in at the discovery center that I think we're going to play around a, with a little bit more because it can handle in part shape. We're about to order some seeds um, like Carex brevior um, yeah. and some like I think that's a plain silver. Wait sedge. did I mean brevior? No that's I'm not sure what you meant but <laughs> okay we should leave. Yeah I don't know we don't <laughs> that's the thing said there there's so much that I don't know about sedges. Yeah really and that's, to learn more that's another one too year. that that sedges are, are notoriously difficult to propagate but um, nurseries are figuring it out and they're becoming more and more available so it's fairly exciting to see what new sedges are yeah out. and I I've seen in like my friend Susan's garden um oak sedge will spread well and it's not, not a super aggressive plant that will outcompete things necessarily but it fills in gaps nicely yeah okay, thank you all right I also encourage everyone to check out the the grow native uh, plant database as a way to search for plants um, that and I put that link in the chat so um, another question came in from Natalie. She wanted to know if you have any other design applications that you use that rather than Adobe Illustrator. I've played around with something called, I think it was Grow Veg. It's more for vegetable gardens, but I have, I've played around with it to try to do like a native garden design and it worked fine. Um, it is a free program that, um, I think it's a free program or there might be a subscription, but that's the thing with digital programs, you typically have to pay for them. Um, but everyone, I think if you have a computer, you probably have the paint, remember paint everybody <laughs> um, application. I don't see why you couldn't do that. So, you know, get your measuring tape out, measure um, the, the footage of your garden space and um, figure out a way to draw it um, on your computer or on paper. I've switched to digital applications just because 
Ugh, I did my own landscape design for my front yard, my old house. And I spent literally like 24, literally 24 hours on it. And then I washed it in my <laughs> washing machine in my pocket. So, sad. so and I switched to digital after that because I could, I was like, <laughs> can't take the heartbreak anymore. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I do it digitally. It's also, I think a lot easier to make edits, um, if it's digital rather than on paper, but it's totally whatever your preference is. But I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to look into more options for that um, upcoming program. Yeah, just to see what's out there. Come to that again. Come to that DIY landscape design class. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, Rebecca asks about an alternative to burning, uh, and bur since she lives in town, burning's not an option. So um, for I guess some of that stewarding. Um, sure. Yeah. 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 So we, um, we, we end up raking off and we've learned a lot of lessons from this, like what gets smothered, what can't really handle, yeah. um, leaving the plant material up what time of year to cut back. So that we're not damaging a lot of stuff. Like and that growth. can be very difficult because we're, we're quickly, and I'm feeling the stress of it quickly approaching the time where it's too late to cut stuff down, but we got a lot, cut a lot of stuff down. Yeah. And that's typically, we're going to typically try to wait until the end of February the beginning of March when it's warmed up a little bit so that some of those insects have time to come out of hibernation or if they're getting displaced they're not totally ruined um, right but so what we do is we take our prairie material um we we if you want to you could leaf blow it off or just rake light um, light raking yeah. light raking you don't yeah, again you don't want to you don't want to accidentally damage the roots beneath the soil or any basal foliage that's still uh, semi evergreen. Yeah. Um, so like lightly rake that whatever you've got on it leaves or whatever. And then if you're able to add that to a brush pile, that's under a tree near a tree in your compost bin, whatever you've got. Yeah. But again, that's for prairie species, right? Yeah, and just so prairie um, the, the full sun or sunnier species, they don't like to be dumped on with plant material. Um, And those artful brush piles, like that's do do what we do. We're not allowed to to burn here either. Um, and so that's we cut them to ten to twelve inches tall and then mm -hmm. make a cute sculpture. So. Yeah, <laughs> or cute a cute arrangement. And we just did a winter beauty program or Sydney did a winter beauty program last weekend. Like I say, I cut cut arrangements, um, save the seed heads. Do that first of all. <laughs> yeah. We also in some of our areas, just to quickly mention this, when we're cutting back, if we do have to cut back the plant material, we're paying attention to. Um, what seeds we want to keep there either for food for animals or for wildlife mm -hmm. or or if we need something to receive yes like in this case of the liatris primrose prairie we did yeah. that I don't think I mentioned that um but yeah we ended that's up that's part of the stewardship process absolutely knowing what seeds you need to have laid back in there mm -hmm. or lay you know left into the yeah. landscape like I removed all the seeds from the stiff goldenrod thinking I'm probably going to edit out that plant completely right uh, but I left the liatra seeds because I want that to reseed because they're tasty to uh, the corms are tasty to wildlife so yeah so but, eat that yeah now. so and sorry I'm totally uh, hijacking this but one thing we were going to talk about at some point was how was that notion yeah. and um, so if you want to have the beauty of the like blazing star for example in your backyard but it keeps getting eaten up uh, <laughs> plant more so that way you get both you have it for wildlife you have it for yourself as um, aesthetically pleasing yeah that's that idea yeah. If you see something working, um, like it's getting devoured, just add more so you can still have enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, that's always our 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 philosophy. We struggle to keep swamp milkweed alive here because everything eats it before it will even flower. And then when it tries to flower, they eat the flowers because there's no leaves left. So our solution is well, we'll just have to plant we'll just have a bunch more swamp milkweed every year. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, so John is asking, when do you do the Chelsea chop? And I, it, from what I, from what I heard, it kind of depends on weather conditions, but typically in the May, June, depending on yeah. the species, like if it's a later blooming plant, like a fall bloomer, you can mm -hmm. cut it a little later in the season, but if it is going to bloom before the liatris gold rods, you're going to cut it a little earlier. Yeah. Yeah. just totally depends on the bloom bloom time so for example like with our um aromatic aster when we've done it before we'll usually cut it in half and like at the probably end of 
July, maybe even beginning of August. That's one of our latest. Well, which, which one? Too late. That's way too late. Sorry, we do. It's I hate. That's our late. I'm sorry. It's in. It's mid June. It's I know. It's so I, I feel you. But that's aromatic Day. Is, one of our is, latest blooming yeah. species. So what you would say you could chop mid-June. it up into mid June. You just know, but it's gonna get so hot come July and. You know, I cut that goldenrod in mid June or the end of June, and it was still too late because because of the drought we had and the heat. Yeah, so, so it, does depend not it just depends on that too. But um, I would say stick the, to mid May to mid June, but definitely yeah. not before. You don't want to cut it if you see buds, flower buds on it. Right, right, right. yeah, because then it's too late. Yeah, it's going to stress the plant out too much. But yeah, the name com- to Chelsea Chop comes from uh, the Chelsea Garden Show which happens every year at, in the fall and they so they cut all their flowers short in the earlier in the summer so that they'll bloom at the exact right time and right height for that Chelsea garden show. <laughs> but this is just a technique to help with uh, floppers and plants that get a little bit too tall or if you need to have something look a little bit more formal yeah. later on. We do it with grasses too. It works. It actually works with River oats, which is a, a yeah. plant that we struggle with a lot because it was um, planted. Uh, it's just a really, really aggressive plant and it was planted prolific. in the wrong. It's a prolific. Sorry, plant. it's very prolific. <laughs> and it was planted in a few uh, spots where it shouldn't have been. And so it's over, out overcrowding um, a lot of other species and and sometimes gets too tall for some spots. So we cut it back. Yeah, you, you'd you be surprised to Isn't see what will bloom a second time. Because again, it's a, a herbivory mim- mimicry, right? Yeah. Um, and river oats was one that reseeded, like it, yeah. the little sea head, heads came back and we're like, oh, we didn't know you would do that. So, <laughs> but yeah, so we, we are very, very lucky to not have deer here. So our herbivory is just a uh, space and rabbits <laughs> and rabbits and squirrels. Yeah. So, uh, so that's something to keep in mind too, is when you're, when you're designing your garden, um, keeping in mind who your gar- who your buffet is going to affect <laughs> and maybe plant with that's a whole other topic. But, yeah. you know, planting deer resistant native plants, there's a lot of those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, again, the best time of year, somewhat Andrea asked the question about when to cut back some hel- helianthus plants. And uh, did I hear that you want to cut those back before they bloom? Yeah. So, okay. most helianthus are going to bloom in like the late summer yeah early fall so you probably would want to cut those earlier with our um willow leaf sunflower I wish we should have had a date on that we well but but the idea is like just cutting it before they you see flower buds um because again what Alex was saying earlier is it will if you cut them when they already have buds on it can stress them out and you run the risk of of the plant not responding well yeah 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 Okay, thank you. All right, next question is from Tiffany, and she wanted to know what, this is a big one, ready? (laughs) What's the impact of non-native, non-invasive species on environmental ecosystems? Oh, non-native, not invasive invasive. species. Okay, this is a a really great question. question. Who wants to go first? I want to go first. Okay, we both, just to start off, have our, our favorite non-native, non-invasive plants. Hostas. From the world. You love hostas. I love hostas. That's my favorite one. I zinnias. Oh, yeah, zinnias. I, love I was surprised to learn um, zinnias are, in your, are your favorite <laughs> non-native plants. They're so <laughs> wonderful. But um, so, yeah, we always tell people that if you want to keep your your non-native plants that are, aren't invasive go right ahead but if you're planting here's where the problem is if you're planting an entire pollinator garden with only cultivars and non-native plants then you're not you're not really you might be supporting um the non-native pollinators but yeah. are you're not best su- stewarding or best supporting um our native yeah um, in that way uh, well, a lot of our pollinators are generalists that will feed on um lots of different types of plants but for instance we, the one we always talk about is the snowball hydrangea all of those those are not even flowers they're yeah. just sterile modified bracts on those plants and they've been bred to be completely um completely sterile completely useless useless to wildlife and so until we know the way that cultivars um uh, what the protein content of the of the of the food for the insects of the color schemes of mm-hmm. the of the 
uh, petals, how that changes the way the insects can view them. Just, you know, we don't, we, we want to encourage people to have a majority of their uh, pollinator and native plantings be native. Yeah. Native and I, I just want to say quickly, I think it all goes back to your gardening goals. Mm -hmm. What's your goal? Are you there to support native wildlife? Then the best way to do that is to pick native plants that are uh, plants are native to your eco region because um, they've evolved together for thousands of years. Now, yeah, if it's non-native, um, let's say you want to support pollinators, but you don't want to get rid of your dad's hostas. Hi, dad. I don't know if you watch it, but um, you can, I think in that case, I, I think it's fine. Um, but I when it becomes a problem, it's when your grandma's honeysuckle is the thing you want to keep around. Grab honeysuckle. Yeah. yeah. When that becomes a problem, it's like, mm, you don't see it spreading in yeah. your yard, but. But if they're not yeah. invasive, I'd say just again, goes back to what, what are your goals? Um, it's so I like to keep my heirloom plants and then have majority of native, native plants in the mix. All right, and she had a particular plant in mind that she wanted to use as a natural border, and it was Miscanthus gigantus, and that's a non-native. Um, I'm not familiar with that particular plant, but right. big grass. <laughs> Isn't it big grass? I'm gonna guess because wait, gigantic. is that that's not pompous? Wait, I can't. No. Um, so that's an alternative. I would suggest would be to go on our grow native database and take a look at some of the uh, grasses that we have um, for uh, our native selections. So, um, so thank you for that. I think you did a great job of answering that that question. Um, the next question is from Scott, and he, he wanted to know how does rainfall affect when you trim plants? How does rainfall affect when you trim plants? Well, I think she she meant that we cut them right before a drought, and then, um, and then we we didn't water them during the drought. Is that right? Is that what you're saying? I don't, oh, wait, I it don't know. Affected the well, you're saying that it affected when the stiff golden rod. Yes, I think the, if if we're if I'm yeah. understanding your question correct, Scott. Yeah, I think just in that with that example of rigid golden rod, Solidago rigida, um, we were in a drought. I cut it, I stress, you know, you will stress the plant out to a point. And that's kind of the idea with cutting it back is uh, enough stress will encourage more blooms at a shorter height. Um, but the lack of water really stressed the plant out to the point where it did not want to rebloom. Um, and so I don't know if I mentioned that I, um, in and, that example. But. Right. And then also to mention that these are new plant. I mean, they're relatively they're young in their plants. second season. Yeah. yeah. So it's just too many factors going against it, but yeah, if Definitely you want an interesting result, though. right. So the idea is to stress you, like you said, stress the plants. out. So we always, when people want to plant rivers, we're always just like, okay, but do, are you sure you really want to plant rivers? If you have to plant rivers, make them stressed out, like give them some factor where there's some competition, some competition make, yeah. or some full shade. Like if you're working with an aggressive species, try it in a situation that it doesn't particularly like mm -hmm. and maybe keep it from going too wild and being yeah good. i'm sorry i think people are too afraid of river oats now and i'm, I'm kind of feeling like maybe i'm just, sorry we need to give it more competition yeah do these yes. things that um challenge it and it's just really hard to dig out it's so say. yeah i know i know sure. yeah okay we're not talking about river oats anyway go on. No, not anymore. <laughs> thank you so melanie uh asked about new england aster i know that's uh one that gets a lot of attention because because it can get pretty tall. Uh, so uh, how much and how often can you can you do damage to the, the pruning situation there with, with New England Aster? Do you have any tips or suggestions? Yes. So that's one of the easiest ones. And one of the first ones that we play around, we played around with cutting early. So um, it's real easy to cut. It, it bounces back so easily. Now, as a shrub, uh, New England Aster is very... Um, brittle um wh when you're when you're working with it just know that going into it that it's um what, what am I trying it breaks very easily so um it's when it's um when you're cutting it you know you want to think about like that that's just something to keep in mind but when you want to think about what time of year you're cutting it what time of year it's gonna bloom so if you're um if you're cutting it in like you what did you say Ju July maybe June. for aromatic even aromatic aster. I'm sorry. This 
This is what we I disagree. love about our, our relationship is we can still disagree <laughs> with each other. Pastor won't even be this tall. I say you could cut it a little later. You all try that out. Let me know how that goes. But it will. That is one we require in every native landscape. I would anyway because of how late it blooms. It's it's feeding pollen to even our non-native bees, which is mostly what we have on it. But some of our late moths and skippers and butterflies yeah. even way into. November. I think aromatic aster is better for that, but it is air. That's what we're talking. Oh, about. I thought you were talking about New England aster. Wait, I'm sorry. Which one were we talking about? New England aster is both. the one that gets crazy tall. Aromatic yeah. aster is slightly shorter. Um, no, it's way shorter. Which one? Sorry, which sorry, one was the question? New England aster. New England. Okay. Oh. Well, I changed my answer then. Aromatic. <laughs> New England, you can absolutely cut. Chop it. Do it earlier, like Sydney, <laughs> like Sydney said. Do it a little earlier. And, uh, and yeah, we chop ours like almost all like two thirds down in our bio swales. It's hard, hard to visualize, yeah. you know, especially if, if the plant isn't very tall yet. Um, you know, my friend Susan does it. We do it with her aromatic aster too, but, um, because it, she knows that it's she, going she to, knows how it. tall yeah. it can get, um, even the aromatic kind, but, um, with new England aster, you know, I, you can cut it down to like, 10 inches or 12 inches and I know it seems drastic and insane mm -hmm. just but try that, if you're too afraid to do it to all your plants try it on at least yeah. one and just see what happens and then you can be better informed for the following season there's a reason fall plants are taller than all the other plants because they, they have they have to be taller than all the plants that grew before them yeah. spring plants are short the fall plants are tall there's a reason for that fall plants but spring plants if they don't need to be tall in order to attract pollinators like if they're in a more formal plant just want to plant yeah. <laughs> if they're more for in a more formal garden you need them to be a little bit shorter and that's not going to affect the access that the pollinators and the birds can have to them then um you know so if you think about it what it, what what spreads a, a new england aster seeds probably a lot of finches right finches are not going to go for that low down seed they're going to only go for those high up branches or high up plants that mm -hmm. they can sit on top of and not get too low to the ground so it's not great for <laughs> making yeah. the finches and again it. all goes but back to your gardening goals that's right? right that's right if you need a short little aster go right ahead and cut it <laughs> Thank you. Um, it looks like we're, um, you know, we're probably going to head, head off the presentation at 530, if that's okay with everyone. I know everyone has other uh, responsibilities for their evening. So, um, but, and we just have had at least 100 questions come in. So, kudos to you ladies for bringing in the questions. Um, we love so, to hear it. Yeah, so we'll definitely make sure and, and follow up. Uh, with participants to get those questions answered. And we still have, you know, several, a couple hundred people hanging on. So uh, a couple more questions maybe, and then um, we'll wrap it up for today. Does that sound good? Sounds, Sounds good. good. All right, great. All right, so um, one, Rachel asked if we, if you can repeat the web programs you use to create your designs. Okay. So for my, when I'm creating a landscape design, I use Adobe Illustrator. Now this is only because I learned how to use this in art school and it works for me. It's not the, it may not be the best program for everyone. Um, I certainly, it works best for me because I've just have gotten used to it. Um, you could use Adobe Photoshop if that's more your jam. Um, I was talking about using paint earlier, like, you know, just your really basic. Um, but frankly, all you need are the exact measurements and then create a grid or uh, sorry, like a legend or a key and make sure it's, it all stays to scale um, or relatively to scale. You know, I, I am not good at math. So um, I think just being consistent and um, making sure you're generally in, in the right ballpark is good enough. And again, don't forget landscape designs are a guide. You don't have to be hard and fast with it. It's just to help guide you through the process and be willing to be flexible and shift along the way and improvise as needed. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, Mary, there's someone who anonymously 
Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, asked, are there places where experts will meet up with newbies and walk around and talk about different plants and techniques? And I'll just go ahead and answer that in that I think our spring native plant sales would be a good place to um, network and maybe talk to some professionals. Uh, and then um, the Grow Native program is also hosting a mingle in Kansas City. Uh, oh, nice. That's going to be... Um, February 16th at Bridging the Gap from 4.30 to 6. Um, and that information can be found on the grownative.org website. Yeah, so, we plan on going to that. And then yeah, you'll see if you there. are in Kansas City, um, every month we do a reoccurring native landscape chat. That's a great time to join us in person for our free registration-based program. Um, we walk around the DC and you, people bring their questions and we talk about gardening tips and tricks on those uh, during those chats. So yeah. Perfect. All right. So Mary asks, when you design a garden, do you orient the plants for visibility from all sides or according to the sun? So would the tallest plants be in the middle with shorter plants working out or yeah. are the tallest? Okay. So it, it yeah, that's what I was thinking is that um, it's dependent on your situation, right? Yeah, sorry, Haley, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, was there, a, I did, what was the rest of the? It just said that shorter plants working, do you use shorter plants working out or tallest plants at the back of garden to not shade the shorter plants? Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, when I said, sorry, I hate it when people say depends, variables, <laughs> but um, so my general rule of thumb is um, yes to having taller plants in the back or in the center. It depends on your vantage point, like where you're going to be viewing your garden. Um, don't forget the view from inside. Like if you have a favorite spot, you like to sit and look out the window, be thinking of vantage points like that. Um, if you have the opportunity to walk around the garden, then I would say your taller plants will be in the middle and then shorter plants coming out towards the edge. Mm -hmm. um, shorter plants are always by the edge, in my opinion, unless you're trying to create um, like a space or an outdoor room, in which case you could use all tall plants to kind of create that hedge effect. But um, that's why I say it depends. But yeah, general rule of thumb, tall plants to the back or in the center, depending on how you're going to be viewing or interacting with that garden. Yeah, and if you think about that, the like when you go out into the prairies, like I said, the what are the the plants that bloom first are your shorter plants, and a lot of those are going to be some of your ground cover species, like in the picture by Brett here. The purple poppy mallow is working as the ground cover species. That's going to continue to creep and bloom for the whole year. But some of the forbs that are blooming, this is just a great timing of this picture but <laughs> late but later on you know there won't be um the same plants blooming and earlier in the season there weren't the same plants blooming mm -hmm. so you want to think about always be thinking about um not just heights but also bloom times in that way when you're mm -hmm. thinking about when you're going to be or where you're going to be viewing from yeah and not just bloom times but also just visual interest i like to say rather than just blooms uh that visual interest could be seed heads could be text. Oh, I'm so specific. sorry. It's too specific because what about <laughs> winter beauty? What about winter beauty? Whatever. Okay. Winter beauty blooms. So yeah, that's those are our thoughts on that. <laughs> <laughs> Always good to think of. We love designing gardens or or helping people figure out what plants to plant next to their bird watching windows. Those are so the fun. best native gardens. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. My favorite winter sport, bird watching. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice. Me too. So uh, last question, uh, because a couple people asked this, uh, what are the hoops that you used in the border of your prairie? <laughs> so I meant to say it, it's, yeah. they're bamboo hoops from Gardener's Edge. That's the website. Um, mm -hmm. They're awesome. And I'm going to have to reset that. Whole, I want to reset the whole fence because it's gotten a little knocked out of place, but it has been a great way to just uh, gently encourage people, um, children mostly got to <laughs> step all over that garden bed while it gets established. The rabbits don't care, but you know, the kids uh, seem to to notice them. Um, so <laughs> you put some lovely climbing rocks in the middle of the I bed. Know, so what I know. To do? it's my fault. Yeah, we use, there's two different sizes. So they're short and tall and Sydney used uh, uh, one or uh, every other one effect, but there's tons of ways you can use them to make a border and we we get maybe about two or three years of use out of them before they're they break down they they do eventually break down which is how I'm gonna call um, another tip too uh with those uh you with your gardening pruners you taught me this yeah. cutting the bamboo at an edge or an angle 
Oh, makes gosh, it so light went off. Uh, at an I angle so that it's sharp and it can stake into the ground. Sorry, our lights are on a timer, so I'm just gonna sketch up here. Um, so yeah, I love those bamboo hoops. Um, they're really they they have a nice clean appearance. They aren't um gaudy like rope like what we had initially wrote like bright yellow rope and uh, rebar but um it's a nice uh way and it's just a yeah. nice aesthetic too so again that intentionality creating that border defining mm -hmm. those edges that can all help in a successful garden yeah that's what we've had to we don't we're lucky enough not to have deer here but we do have to um design our gardens and um steward them with um children in mind with little little hands and little feet in mind so we yeah. we keep our gardens safe and <laughs> separate safe from to them too yeah absolutely. for them yeah we have some areas that they're encouraged to explore but others that we make it very clear that please don't explore <laughs> well thank you so much ladies as i mentioned before this webinar is being recorded or an email back to you tomorrow with the webinar link and other helpful resources. And then we also hope you'll join us as we host the next um, webinar. It's Grow Native Master Class entitled Practical Magic for Pondscapes with Scott Woodbury. And that'll be on February 15th at 4 p.m. And again, don't forget to check out the other opportunities to see and hear from Alex and Sydney. Thank you so much again. And we uh, thank all of you for joining us and have a great weekend. Thank you so much. Thank we appreciate you. everyone's time tonight. Have a good one. Thank you. Take care.